Hospital Porters, Pride and Dignity, Stop the New World Order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. Well, today, Hapanwo TV viewers, I'm going somewhere very unusual indeed. I'm going to Wales. Yes, I actually come from Wales. You might have guessed that. With a name like Emily George, I can hardly come from Scotland, can I? <laughs> um, and I'm going back to my old, the land of my birth, my homeland, I suppose you could call it. Um, for the first time in about 12 years. And I'm going to a place called Llandrisla, which is in North East Wales. Um, it's a small settlement in the foothills of a range of mountains called the Berwyn Mountains. Now, um, the Berwyn Mountains is, is a high and desolate and um, um, rather hostile, um, in terms of its environment, place in, uh, in North East Wales. And um, the reason I'm going there is 40 years ago today, because today is the 23rd of January 2014, so 40 years ago today, the 23rd of January 1974, something very unusual happened indeed. Something out of this world, perhaps literally. There was, um, in uh, the evening, people were just sitting down in front of their tellies, weather was a bit miserable, as it tends to be in that part of Wales at that time of year, and there was a huge explosion and an earthquake, and people rushed out into the streets. There were, some of them phoned the police and emergency services, there were strange lights in the sky, people thought a plane might have crashed. No one knew for sure. Uh, it was the next day news teams descended on the area. There was a massive uh, amount of publicity. Newspapers covered it. John Craven's News Round covered it. <coughs> it, was, um, it was all over the media. And um, basically it was put down to an earthquake, although no one could quite understand exactly where that you know the what the earthquake was and um, what caused it. It was a bit of a it was called the enigmatic tremor and explosion of the Berwyn Mountains. Enigmatic, of course, meaning mysterious, unknown. Um, it, was, it was actually some time later that people started talking about other things that had happened there, which thickened the plot considerably. For example, somebody saw on the side of the mountains where they were driving across a mountain pass, a large spherical orange coloured pulsating lit object sitting on the side of the mountainside or hovering just above the mountainside. Um, this is um, obviously we're talking about a UFO situation here and that has become known as the Bedouin Mountains UFO. There was also some other, um, some other um, elements involved. For example, um, there was a very strong military presence in the area, soldiers marching everywhere, army lorries, um, military vehicles, there were police roadblocks everywhere, a lot of large areas of the mountains were sealed off for a long period of time. Well, as far as we know, no aircraft crashed there. Um, no one f saw signs of any meteor impact, there was no, the, the earthquake data didn't match up as something what you normally called a normal earthquake. For example, um, the, um, the epicenter of the earthquake quake was traced to be above ground, which is, you never get in a real earthquake. All kinds of strange things like that. And um, well, I th this this has sort of become known as the the Welsh Roswell because it's so significant. Um, I'm not certain there was any crash retrieval of any kind there, but still, it's the most one of the most significant UFO incidents in in Britain. Certainly, the most in Wales. And um, it's been very it's been very controversial. There's been an awful lot of um, controversy and there has been I think an organized cover-up of this event it's the you know the UFO issue has been ridiculed there's been a lot of very spoof articles written about it there's there's unfortunately people within the UFO investigation community have played their role in distorting and suppressing information on this so I thought well that's that needs to change I decided that Seeing as we were coming up to the 40th anniversary of the event, we should mark the occasion. Firstly, to, for, firstly for just for commemorative purposes, but also to hopefully trigger a, a, new, a, you know, a new wave of interest in the subject. A new, um, maybe a, a new attempt to get witnesses to come forward, things like that. So I set up this Facebook group. Bellman 40. And there's a little... Uh, there's the little uh, graphic I did for it. The this is I mean this, I know this is a daytime photo, but this is kind of an artist's impression of what what the witness saw on the mountain pass that night. 
a large spherical orange object on the side of the mountain. Um, although uh, the artist, in fact, was me, so I use that term in its broadest possible sense. Um, as you see, I've made it. I've made it English and Welsh in the in the box here. PNH actually stands for Peth Nidwedi Nawod and Hedvan, which is um, a literal translation, or at least I, I think it is a literal translation of the word unidentified flying object, although I'm not certain that's correct. I'm not certain that's correct Welsh, actually. Um, even though I, I grew up in a Welsh-speaking community, my uncle and his family Welsh-speaking, I've become rather rusty since I moved to Oxford when I was a little kid. But I've still managed to create a bilingual description box there, you know. So, um, and this this group was very, very um, active indeed. There was a lot of um, very interesting um, contributions from people. We had a large number of members. Um, now, it was originally just going to be a, a standard meetup um, where we just a few people would get, you would get together in the location and maybe have a few beers, have a chat, and do a sky watch. And then, to his credit, Richard D. Hall stepped in and he decided he would um, he would help us. He would. He would help us out by coming along and doing a special screening of his movie. He did, he's done a documentary film all about the Berwyn Mountains incident. And this is it. I strongly recommend getting a copy of this. The Berwyn UFO cover-up exposed by a film by Richard D. Hall. And this is, this is the best film ever made about the Bedouin Mountains UFO incident. In fact, it's probably the only good one made about the incident, actually, if I'm honest. You can get this from the richplanet.net website. And so he's going to come to the pub, he's hired the place, and we're going to have a special screening of that film. So more and more people are coming, which is really, really good. We've got a large number of people coming. Um, should, so it should be what's, what started out as a little kind of meetup has turned into what's looks like it's going to be a major conference and of course after we've had the little after we've had this sort of like um, the film showing and that we're planning on doing a little sky watch which you you can't have a UFO event without a sky watch so we're going to go somewhere where we can uh, have, a, have a look around and um, point our cameras at the sky and have a chat and have a laugh and things like that and you never know we might see something the UFOs may decide that they're going to come back and help us commemorate this 40th anniversary of the incident. You never know. We don't know yet, but they could do. And um, oh, I've got my regulatory T-shirt on here. You can't go anywhere without that, can you? Hmm. <laughs> OK, it's time to make another crop circle. Yeah, I love that. That's Dennis and Marion on the stall at um, Pro. They sold me that years ago, and I've still got it. Well, there's only one thing we can do now, and that is to proceed to... Sandrifla in Wales and see what we can find out. Well, we're heading for Wales now. I'm in a car here with Colin Wolford, who you will know from Hello. previous productions. We've just passed um, Telford. If I find the right place on the map, I just shut the map when I was getting the camera out, and that's typical. Yeah, we're just passing um, Telford. We're heading for Shrewsbury and then on to Wales, and you can see here some high hills. Which is the which is the first sign that we're getting into the the much more hilly and mountainous areas of Wales. I mean, we're going to leave England behind us. A little way to go. Yep, we're getting there, and we're listening to KLF. All right. Yay! All right. We're justified and ancient. Yeah, you can't you can't ask. I don't think you can ask for better than that when we're doing a we're going on a UFO hunt. And interestingly, as me and Colin were just saying, today's the twenty third, yeah. and of course the KLF. Fans, they also they tend to know an awful lot about Robert Anton Wilson. They did a lot of things on the 23rd. I think they paid mm. a million pounds on the 23rd. Did they? Yeah. Ah, because 2023 20, is a very important number for the KLF, mm. and it's a very important number for for Robert Anton Wilson, who of course inspired a lot of the KLF. I didn't know that when I first started yeah. listening to the KLF, but then I I listened to them and then I read the Illuminatus yeah. trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson, and Robert Shea, and is by far the finest novel I've ever read. And it captivated me, and um, I started getting into more of Robert Anton Wilson and watching some of his lectures. He's such a brilliant man, he's so enthralling to listen to. Look, there's the hills. And he's so um, lovable and so funny and so wise, and same shame we lost him. Anyway, more later. Stay tuned. Okay, we're at a welcome break service station, and there's a thing here 
I don't know what this is, it looks like some kind of fracking machine. I'm just going to go and have a look at it. We're not far from Wales now, we're sort of coming close to the border, the old land. So I've not been to for a long time, even though that's where I come from. Being an Emlyn Jones, I'd have to. What's that? Naismith. Patrick Croft, Patrick Croft. 1917, number 1336. Some kind of steam thing. The steam hammer. Nice. Oh. And one derby smelting iron. This goes back to my school history lessons. Oh wow, so this what there it is in action. Steam hammer. It's a pe old piece of industrial memorabilia. The Iron Bridge Gorge Museum. We're coming close, we're close to that now. Oh, it's cold, isn't it? It's, it's I'm here with Colin. <laughs> yeah, is it? Yeah. Well, gonna, we're going to continue our journey. We're well on the way. So, see you in a minute. Helicopter over there. Helicopter, is there? Yeah, look at those mountains. Seriously hovering above a field. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's been helicopters everywhere. Yeah? Look at those yeah. mountains. That is our destination. The Berwyn Mountains. It's come back. The spaceship's come back. Is it? Ah. Oh. <laughs> No, it could be, it could be investigated. Well, you never know, it's some more of those mountains over there. I mean, it's, the scenery is something I'm not used to. Absolutely amazing. But I definitely feel we're getting close now. Definitely feel it's the atmosphere's changed. Right, we're sort of stuck behind this lorry trying to overtake him. It reminds me of that film Duel, that Steven Spielberg, Spielberg film. We'll overtake him and he'll chase us all the way to, to the factory, though, trying to crack, trying to kill us. <laughs> The River D. And we're getting close to Van Gothen in West Wales. Yeah, and it's nice, isn't it? There you go. Well, yeah. Welcome to Wales, Croeso hey. Gunry. <laughs> Guide me all oh, the great tree. There you go, Rex Pilgrim. Through uh, this barren land. <laughs> glad, glad, played your <laughs> Louis. Glad trouble I promise if you give me 20 if you thumb this video 20 20 times up I won't sing again <laughs> more some more beautiful Welsh scenery there accompanied by uh, the KLF chill out album and with, I mean with Colin and I'm filming where we are where we actually are now is actually um, a place called Langothen which is <coughs> in northeast Wales near the border and the reason I want to film you this is something um, it, it comes into the Bedouin Mountain story quite a lot because um, which I, I'll exp be explaining more later about this but basically there were some troops stationed here at Langothen and they were there on the night of the uh, Berwyn Mountains incident and of course one of the big mysteries of Berwyn Mountains is the troops were in the area to, at to attend the UFO incident but they were there so quickly they were there within 50 minutes now if they'd had to deploy from one of their bases there's no way they could get there that quickly so it means that there was a quick there was a forward operation operational force already on standby in the area when there was the explosion and there was the earthquake and the UFO came down and how the government knew we don't know we don't know how how why or how they knew in advance this was going to happen and they got the they got the troops ready on on the station <coughs> ready to respond immediately big mystery one of the many mysteries of uh, the Bellerin Mountains incident which I'll talk more about later our hospital porters pride and dignity and all that sort of thing um, this is the map I'm using for my expedition it is Bala Lake and Vrenui it is Ordnance Survey Land Ranger plate number 125 <clears throat> and now we're going to examine where I'm going to go at this strange and momentous event open it up excuse me one moment One second, a Panwell TV viewer. Sorry to keep you waiting. Oh, I don't, I don't think half of it I actually need to open because 
that's the half that counts, which is here. Right, um, and here we are, and as you can see, it's a uh, quite a dramatic locale. In fact, um, I would say of all the major UFO events that have happened in the world, um, this one possibly has the most. Well, this one possibly took place in the pla in the location with the most dramatic geography. This is where we're going to be going. This region here, northeast Wales. It is just about there to sort of orientate yourself. This is this is Llandrillo. This is the town where everything centres around. Um, another lo famous, another uh, principal location is Llanderfel there, and that's where one of the principal witnesses lived, as you will be seeing. And um, these are these are these places here. This is uh, Cadair Bronwen. This uh, this high plateau-like mountain here, just to the east of Llandrillo, just Llandrillo sits at the foot of the mountain. Look at those tight contours there. There's a very steep hillside with these woods here. Um, that's where the police uh, went to explore, and um, that's where they thought the plane crash might be. And as went this 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 very steep hill hillside mountainside eventually gives way to the the plateau area, leading up to the peak of the mountain. Now, uh, Cato Berwin is here. This is another peak further along. And this is uh, the location where the UFO actually came down to the ground. And that um, the witness, Pat Evans, who's round about there, actually saw it. Now, if you watch Richard D. Hall's film, you'll, you'll work out how I know this. But I've actually marked the location where the UFO probably was. It's somewhere within that circle, and this is an object 15 to uh, 22 metres in diameter. And um, this, is a, this is a large object just sitting there on the mountainside or hovering just above it. Now, these woods here are very, very interesting indeed. Now, I do recommend you watch Richard D. Hall's film again because he's discovered a very strange feature within these woods. And they're not 100% certain because the, the people who... the the forestry commission or the forestry company that owns these woods won't reveal it for some reason they're very reluctant to talk about it but um this this wooded area here didn't exist in 1974 probably and that um it, these trees were actually planted after that event this wood is a lot bigger now in other words than it was 40 years ago so um so that's the uh, kind of situation this is where all this happened where it took place and um, as you can see here and if you as you'll see when we when we actually get there the actual location of the uh, of the UFO's landing site is an extremely difficult place to get to in fact at night time in winter it's virtually impossible unless you really know what you're doing it's not actually safe to to actually try to climb to that location in those conditions so um, but as you'll see, you know, there were people there, ready, and waiting, which is a, a very, very important issue, which I'm going to come to later on in the film. In fact, it's probably one of the most important anomalies associated with this case. As you'll see in Richard D. Hall's film, there, there was a, this can be triangulated, because someone else somewhere around here, it's a place called Garth Koch, a guy called Mike Saville and his family, also saw the object. I don't know where Garth Koch, it, Garth Koch is, somewhere in this area here, I think. It was, it's an 85 degree angle compared to where Pat Evans was anyway, so it's somewhere around here. Um, they saw the object too, which is how it was uh, triangulated to its current location. Um, the only thing now to do is go and actually stop looking at maps and actually go there and uh, see what we can see. Because um, I'm very, very keen to find out more and to actually see these places myself. So if you care to accompany me, we shall now proceed to the areas on this map and have a look at them. Okay, we're at uh, a little, lovely little village. It's very sleepy, isn't it? Yeah. It's called uh, Llanderfell, or as Andy Roberts call it, Clan the Fell. Old Andy Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, it's it's called it's pronounced Llanderfell, and this is very this is this little village plays a crucial part in um, the Bedouin Mountain story because. Um, this is where Pat Evans used to live, although she's moved abroad now. She doesn't talk much to people. Rumour has it. Um, 
but um, at uh, just about just about 9 p.m. This was just a few minutes after the uh, explosion and the earthquake, and everyone was sort of like panicking, and calling the police. She and her daughter has got into a car from one of these houses here and drove up onto the pass to attend what they thought would be a plane crash because Pat Evans was a nurse and her daughters were both first aid trained so they thought they could go up there and lend a hand to the mountain rescue team. Um, and we're now going to retrace the drive she made to get up there and we'll see where it took her. Coming up, More coming up soon. Hospital Porter's pride and dignity stopped the New World Order. Welcome to Hapanwo TV. And I'm actually filming in one of the most unusual and remarkable locations I've ever found. I'll just give you a 360. It's one of the most remarkable locations I think I've ever filmed for Hapanwo TV. Yeah, we're we are standing on the Colin and I. We've, we've actually wrapped up a bit yeah, because we're about. Yeah, I mean the temperature has dropped about 10 degrees since we left Van Der Velde, and um, it's really bitter up here. Actually, I've got me. I'm glad I brought my woolly hat. Um, we're standing on the infamous B4391, roughly at the spot where Pat Evans. Um, as we explained, she left Van Der Velde about 9 p.m. She drove up here. Took her, it must have taken her maybe a bit longer than it took us because it was dark. She got to about this spot here and she looked across at what we see in front of us. And what we see this magnificent view, it's, it is magnificent, but it's you were saying we were driving along here, you can't because you can't actually see anything else. It's like it's always like a bit like an alien landscape up here yeah. in the Bedouin Mountains. We're on the only pass through the Bedouin Mountains that links one side of them to the other to the rest of Wales. And it is alien up here, don't you reckon, Colin? What's yeah. your impressions of this yeah, location? Doctor Who landscape, isn't it? Yeah, Do well, Doctor Who landscape, or maybe a, a Pink Floyd album cover. <laughs> That's what it looks like. <laughs> um, I've never been to a place like this ever. I don't think. Um, now where we are, this road is not too quiet, luckily. Um, let's give our bearings for a moment. I, I mean, um, I showed you on the map a little while ago, see the breath condensing on me. I showed you on the map a little while ago exactly where we were. Uh, but um, basically, I showed you over there, that over there, that high peak over there, that is Kadai Berwen. And that is the peak which has been confused with Kadai Bronwen. Kadai Bronwen is over there. That's Kadai of Bronwen. They're both very tall mountains at the peak of the Berwen range. And this uh, all along here is the side of Kada Bedouin. I showed you on the map where the object was. Now what happened was Pat Evans stopped where we're stopping. It was dark, it was rainy, it was wet. Very often these mountains actually get covered in cloud, but they were free of cloud, but it was a very wet and miserable night. And over in that direction she saw a large spherical object, which she described as pulsating and glowing. It was resting on the mountainside, just about, about there, just out, just like maybe a couple of degrees from that tree line, just about there above that scree. If you watch Richard D. Hall's film, I'll tell you all about it. The object, um, the object was uh, slightly smaller than the full moon. She said its apparent size was slightly smaller than the full moon, as Richard described. You can actually, you can actually get if you know how far away it is. You know how, uh, how the, its apparent size. You can actually gauge its, it, the actual, the actual size of the object. And he calculated it was between 20, 18 and 22 meters in diameter. That's uh, very, very. That's about, it's approaching 70 to 80 feet in my language. That's big, isn't it? That's a big object. It is, yeah. Um, yep, it's in, 40 years ago, today, this happened. And it's important to realise, now look, that over there is Kadai, that over there is Kadai of Bronwen, that mountain there, um, that there. And um, as you can see, what's important to realise is that it's, I'm sure you can see, Colin, that the sides are very steep where all that wood, yeah. those woods are. Yeah. But when you get to the top, it opens out, but it's, it's yeah. flat at the yeah. top. So it's, it's not like a sort of like a mountain. It's not like Kadai Bedouin, which is more like a sort of like regular mountain peak. It's more like a plateau. Um, now at the bottom of, you see where those woods are there? At the bottom of there is Llandrithlo. That there, you could just about see Llandrithlo, which is where we'll be heading next. Um, that is the town which is nearest to the, where the event took happen. But it's important to realise, as Richard D. Hall explains in his film, the people in Llandrithlo had no view of this location 
where the object actually was. They could not see it because they were basically at the bottom of that slope on the side of Kadai de Bronwen. So the police went up Kadai de Bronwen with the Hugh Lloyd and the little boy who helped them, who still lives in this area, and he's he is speaking to journalists, if, even if Pat Evans is not. And they didn't see anything, but um, Pat Evans saw the object. Now, what's what, Andy, even Andy Roberts admits this now, right? But she did not see the bloody poachers' lights. <laughs> Uh, Pat Evans did not, they were not bloody poachers. Like it was over there, for, it was in the wrong direction for a start. The posters were over there on Calaya Bronwyn in those woods. I feel like the from light, uh, yeah. lighthouse. The lighthouse. <laughs> the <laughs> flying truckload of manure. Being driven by a parachute test dummy, no doubt. And, um, of course, the joyriding ice cream van, yeah. But even Andy Roberts has been forced, I think, reluctantly to admit that she didn't see the posters' lights. Um, she saw a completely separate object in a completely separate location. Now, what was confusing, what people, what added to the confusion was that she, the, uh, Pat described seeing the, the main object, a circular pulsating orange-red um, light on the mountainside there, but she saw other lights around it, which she describes as looking like fairy lights or torches, which were surrounding the object. Now, what these may well have been is actually people with torches. And this is the strange thing we were talking about earlier on when we went through Llangollen. There were already people on the mountain when it happened. The thing is, though, is this was barely half an hour after the object landed. Now, the, the best, the, the best, they, you know, as I said, if these, the people on the mountainside with the torches may well have been the military team dispatched to deal with this situation. Hence why it's known as the Welsh Roswell. Mm. The, the truth of the matter is, though, they must have already been on that mountain. I know these are fit guys, they've got good maps, they're trained for this, you know, they're trained to hike, hike through unhospitable un country when they train them in the well in the army, but still, <laughs> there's a limit to what they can do, they're not bloody Rambo, <laughs> all right, no, uh, you, they, they'd have to already be on station ready when the object landed, at least somewhere you can drive and walk within half an hour, because this was just about half an hour after the explosion. <laughs> Oh, so that's the situation we have now. It's absolutely beautiful, as you say, alien-looking landscape here. And what Pat did was she stayed here and watched it. What she did was after that, which we'll do in a minute, she drove up towards the turning point. There's a turning point in the road just up here. And then she turned around and came back. And she went, she just went, she stayed, she came and stopped and she watched for another 10 minutes. And then she, she went home. And she, she wishes she stayed longer because she doesn't know what happened to the thing. Maybe she, if she did, though, maybe she wouldn't be here today. Maybe she, she might have seen too much. So. <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good point. Um, as I said, Pat Evans is a bit of a mysterious character. She was originally happy to talk to the media. She did, document, she did a documentary about it. She spoke to Andy Roberts. She spoke to Margaret Fry. Um, she spoke to Scott Felton and a couple of other people. But then suddenly she went quiet. And now she's gone somewhere else. No, she's not in the country. She's gone abroad. She doesn't speak to the media. She just wants to forget about it. And the rumour has... Well, she's a, a retired nurse. She's earning a bit. She's on a bit more money than a retired nurse should be on. Yeah. Put it that way. <laughs> What's your impressions yeah. of all this, Colin? Well, yeah, it is a bit suspicious. I mean, <laughs> but you know, the dead don't talk, as they say. Yeah. People are threatened, and you hear about things where people, you know, give them money to keep quiet about events, then it can be very sort of. Um, it's an incentive, isn't it? Yeah. Shut their mouths. I mean, it's only going to be hardcore ufologists who, who wouldn't <laughs> sort of kind of keep quiet. About yeah. Um, hard, yeah. <sighs> it's that's right. Yeah. It's cold. You can see the clouds feel very low down. They they feel they feel very low. And sometimes they can come this low. I think we're about two thousand feet, something yeah. like that. Been, I know that's not very. Been quite well the weather, haven't we? Because mm. the weather's been quite nice on the drive up here. I know the the, the mindset guys are going. Hey, we have mountains ten thousand feet in North America, and they and they don't. I know, guys, but I mean, this this it's not just the height; it's the the way they fit in with the rest of the landscape. And there's definitely a real the temperatures bloody drop about ten degrees. So it's jelly by freezing now, I'd say. Conditions for Skywatch later then, Ben. Or? Ooh, if we could get up here, I mean, <laughs> to be honest, it's. Or wherever we go. If we're going to spend the whole night somewhere, it's probably not the best. No. I don't think it's. It wouldn't be very no, nice somewhere because where you, you know, we'll... somewhere you can at least. It's a bit warmer. Yeah. I mean, and it's actually it's actually not safe to go climbing in these mountains at night in winter. It's just you can easily get lost. You, there are cliffs. There's a rock. There are rock falls. Um, you can get lost. Quiet. Yeah, there's a lot of mud and water, so you, yeah. you, can, you can see that. People people have died up here. 
Yeah, people have died. Right. Well, so. The aliens. Is <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, the aliens have. And this is uh, what happened 40 years ago. And whether, uh, will the aliens come back tonight, 40 years later, to honour this anniversary? I don't know, but. <laughs> We'll be back here at the 50th anniversary in 10 years, until they, you know, until they do. If you haven't had disclosure by then, and Stephen Bassett hasn't worked his magic and done his funky stuff, you know. I can see why they would come to the world, though. It is a beautiful place. I haven't been in yeah. 20, I don't know, 30 years or so. Maybe longer, 30. It's possible they were interdimensional tourists who just yeah. thought, well, this is a... I've heard this is lovely. Let's come here. <laughs> There's more mountains over there behind us, and this alien strange... Almost, yeah, almost extraterrestrial landscape here. There's, there's nothing but the sound of the wind and running water in the drainage brook. Mm. No, I mean, this, this is quite quiet, this road, the B4391. It's a well-surfaced, well-managed road. It looks like it's just been painted. There's a little stream here. And, and this beautiful, unearthly landscape. So, well, there's more coming. <laughs> See you later. Hmm. Hmm. Hospital of Portless Pride and Dignity, stop the new world with order. Welcome to Panwo TV and we're back at ground level now and we are in Slandrislo. There's the church and there's the houses here, very, very traditional Welsh village. And there's this lovely river here. With a stone bridge, and this is the famous phone box. Yeah, what happened was um, 40 years ago, like I said in the evening, there was this. Um, the first, this was the uh, place, the inhabited location, the settlement nearest the actual event when it happened, the epicenter of the explosion and the earthquake. And the first thing, uh, these people here were the first to know anything was up because um, they felt and heard a massive noise and uh, tremor under their feet, and, um, and that's when they came. Colin's over there. <laughs> Colin's, he's with us, and that's basically when they knew something was up. And uh, a lot of them, of course, first thing they did was call the police, and um, they called from this phone box. You don't see many of these nowadays. <sighs> nice to and it's still open, that's good. Yeah, they came in here. I need to call the police because, um, I think it was a cure them out here. <laughs> of course, in those days, uh, you didn't have mo they didn't have mobile phones in 1974. That's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. So um, everyone was everyone was out on the streets. Everyone was wondering what the hell was going on, that's thinking that's thinking there. there'd that's been yeah, <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah, thinking there'd been some huge. They, I think they thought there'd been they'd been some huge um, earth. They thought there was an earthquake and explosion. They heard this loud noise. Everyone was out on the streets. Everyone, everyone was at this phone box calling yeah. the police, wondering what the hell was going on. Yeah. And here we are, Pont Sandrislo Bridge. There we are. And it's very very nice. So we're just going to go. We're just going to go and have a look at this lovely little spot down here. I don't know how much weather this was here, or whether that bridge was there in 1974, but there's a lovely stream. Yeah. But you don't often see, in, as in this is a, something you, you often get in Wales and not in Oxford or where we come from or London, where Colin comes from. It's like, um, it's really cute and it's really lovely. And there's this bench here dedicated to Tesney Lois, Lois Edwards. To the well organised mind, death is but the next great adventure. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> lovely flowers there. Thanks. More coming later. So that is Llandrisho, this lovely little settlement in the valley at the foot of uh, Cadair Bronwyn. And um, after having a little film around the village, we went into the Dudley Arms Hotel, which is the principal pub there. And um, we had a couple of drinks. I met up with some of the others. And we watched Richard D. Hall's film. And it was really good too. We all sat there and uh, and, uh, and watched it on his projector. And, and some of the other people in the pub actually came and watched too, who weren't part of our group. There were some, it seems to be quite a lot of visitors there. It seems to be quite a, a touristy place. And there were some, there were some people doing a hunting party there. And um, they came and watched too. Uh, so maybe Richard has reached a few people outside of the, the choir he normally preaches to. Um, I hope so. Um, and this is the goal of what I intended with this whole event. Um, to, to have, uh, maybe to use this commemorative anniversary is a trigger point this fourth decade the end of the fourth decade the 40th anniversary to reignite interest in the subject 
Well, anyway, after after we watched the film and we had a few more drinks and then socialised a little bit more with some of the people, we met some of the witnesses too, including Hugh Lloyd. Um, he was there. Um, so after that, we headed up back to the pass to do a bit of sky watching. Oh, they just put the light shot on. There we are. Huh? Can you see me now? I'm just going to test the night shot. Um, yeah, it's working. Hello, Colin. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm here with Colin. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've, and I've, I'm here with um, who's this? This one is Mark. Mark. Mm. You will look different in the night shot, and that one is. I'll put some extra light on there. That is J Jason. Hello. Hello, Jason. <laughs> and he's. This is like a, and a circle, mate. Jay. Like, Jay, yeah. yeah. Looking like he's had a robber bang, got a fly on a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> and over here, we have, I believe, Neil. Neil, yes. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you? You're Neil, you remember from the uh, Truth Ma UFO Truth Magazine conference video yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and we are actually up on the pass again, where we were earlier, but it's dark. We wanted to capture the image of what. Of what um, Pat Evans would have seen, and we can't do that during the daytime where we were before. <coughs> we come here now. Now we've had a lovely evening. We've been um, Richard D. Hall turned up and Scott Felton, and we watched. This is a special screening of the video, the Bedouin UFO cover-up exposed in the pub, a lovely pub called the Dudley Dudley Arms Hotel. And we met up with a few people, some nice people from the local area, including Hugh Lloyd who's one of the witnesses, and um, a couple of other people who remember it well. It's obviously a big part of folk history here. Um, just gonna listen to the course silence. So quiet here. It's, it's absolutely dead calm in terms of wind. There's a little bit of clear sky, I can see some stars. Now, now you, you can't see this, but I can just see the, the shadow of uh, Kadai the Bedouin. And da down over there is the valley where Llandrillo is. Now, in the distance, I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a big red beacon. That's the Corwan beacon. And um, Mr. Andy Roberts, even he had to admit this wasn't true in the end. He first tried to suspect that Pat Evans had seen the Corwan beacon, and she hadn't. Uh, but that's, it. that's that big... See that big red marker over there? Do you see the big red thing? Can you see it over there? That's down in the valley. Can you see the big red thing, everybody? Mm. That's the Corwen beacon. Now, apparently, this big sphere, sphere thing, which Pat Evans saw and her two daughters, Andy Roberts, for a while, thought, said, tried to pretend that she'd seen that and she'd mistaken it for a big spherical UFO. Uh, even he has now had to admit that's, that's a load of crap. Yeah. <laughs> Just imagine you're driving up here, it's completely dark, and you see a big orange circular thing over there. Yeah. Must be weird. Really weird. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, you won't be able to see this at Panama TV viewers on the camera. Won't, the camera won't pick it up, but we've got a most amazing um, silhouette of the mountains. <laughs> I've put my gloves on because my hands are freezing. Yeah, it's it's but we've had a lovely, lovely time. And, um, it's now, what's the time? Mm. Yeah. Have you had a nice time, um, Jason? Yeah. You have. Oh, good, yeah. Have you been into UFOs for long? Uh, yeah, quite a long time. In and out. Yeah. In and out. Literally. Yeah. That's the worry, isn't it? Um, yeah, no. It's been, oh, cool. Uh, like everybody else here who enjoyed ourselves tonight and mm. um, did you see how close those sheep were on the way yeah, yeah we, we've actually found some sheep didn't we Park, it's parking their asses right by the side of the road yeah. they wanted to pull over <laughs> oh yes boy oh yes <laughs> uh, anyone else want to be on her panero tv these lads are here on her Panamo TV. Oh, hello, Ben. Hello, hello Mark. Mark. Yeah. I'm Mark. I'm from Nottingham. Mm. Oh, good, good. Local, local lad. Yeah. Well, uh, when I'm with a stain, yeah. <laughs> my my darling Astain, who can't be with us this evening. But um, so, how long have you been into UFOs? Um, got into it through the conspiracy angle. <laughs> um, <laughs> probably best part of eight. Eight to ten years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Still learning things new every day, which is yeah. good. 
from uh, experts like yourself. Oh, I do. We do. We do try. I'm sure I learn a lot from you as well. <laughs> but, um, that's amazing. What did you think of this evening with the oh, Trinity Hall? Yeah, great, great, yeah. great people, great company, a few mm. jars. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Listen to the silence for a minute, guys. Just stand still, listen to the silence. It's incredible. Have you ever heard that before? Or anything like that? I hear it very often, not where I No, very, very rare do you, do we? It is strange, yeah. And it's strange how little silence there is in our world. We've got those sheep we saw, didn't Yeah, there's no sound, there's the tiniest breath of wind. For January, it's really... We're high up in the Welsh mountains, right high on the pass, not a breath of wind. Maybe, um... <sighs> now we're just going to wait to see. Where are you? Let's do the CE5 protocols. Uh, has anyone paid their eight thousand dollars to Stephen Greer so they've learned how to do it? No. That's right. I am your Messiah, <laughs> and we're going to go sky. Wait, wait, put that camera down. Eighty thousand dollars, please. <laughs> <laughs> This is cutting-edge <laughs> ufology, isn't it, Ben? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Hardcore. Oh, yeah. You can just make out a few stars. Oh, oh really? There are a few, yeah. I know so your you eyes are... adapt to the dark, don't they? And then if you, you can... just focus ah, okay. on one place, you can see them through. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They do eventually come out, these stars. And there's some in the valley down there where San Rito is. I don't know if you can see this at Panama TV viewers, but there's lots. I can see the lights of street lights. There's some. There's some moving cars. It's about one o'clock in the morning now. Just gone. Can you imagine what's going through these soldiers or whatever back in '74? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can imagine poor Pat Evans saying, "What's that over there?" Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, my radio is not even working. How freaky is that? <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a common thing of UFOs, isn't it? You oh, get like, um, you get like electronic interference, and um, which damp which prevents electronic stuff from working. Sometimes car engines stop. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, but it was a lonely walk for that soldier back into town, though. Yeah, which was, uh, mm -hmm. that's know, right. But the, the people he stopped at one of the houses on the and asked to use the phone because his radio wasn't working and. They won't be identified, though. Richard Richard D. Hall said in his movie that the, those people won't be identified. So I wonder if those people can see us over there. They'll think we're poachers lamping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where's the anomaly place then, Ben? Whereabouts is that? Well, that's just a short distance from where Pat Evans saw the object in the woods. In that direction. Yeah, it's the end of a path, uh, a forest track. And the anomaly is this big gouged out um, uh, excavation in the ground. Now, I asked a friend of mine who's a trained geologist, and he said, if that's, that's not an in impact crater, there's no ejector from it, also it's too small. Something that could strike the ground with a force that could cause that tremor would leave a much bigger hole. It would leave, do a lot more damage. Um, <laughs> One of our guys is exploring. You need a torch to see where you're going in this, but yeah. there's basically the, there's no fence. There's just like brush. It's marshy, like oh, right. I won't go in there because I've got one of Wellingtons, but um, it's just thick grass, and it's uh, leaves. It's about <sighs> it's about a mile and a half to the point where the the UFO landed. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> There never been a fence here. There used to be a fence, yeah. according to Pat Evans. Yeah, there was a fence here once. There's a fence further down. I mean, the fence just carries <coughs> just a few hundred yards down there. The fence carries on. But um, this is really quite a, the, incredibly atmospheric. It's the silence. It's almost like you can hear the universe. It's like being out in space. Yeah, there's some, there are some clouds. There's some stars are visible. 
which means that there are which means we can see things but um this is very different to the sky watch i think on st anne's beach <laughs> which you remember that colin yeah, the sky was, um, that, that was quite fun. We were, first of all, we were blind drunk. <laughs> we weren't on our best behaviour. Mm. Where's Brian Cox when you need him? Oh, ah, yes, you knobbers, what are you doing now? <laughs> what are you doing, sitting out in the dead of night? <laughs> um, to look for nothing, <laughs> nothing. What do you think, Brian? There's nothing there. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have Richard Dawkins. Hmm. Well, and I, I can say that um, there's no that um, I, we have to deal with science, and um, well, uh, I own science; it's my personal property. I don't think I know. Oh, doctor, doctor, my magisteria are overlapping. Oh, we got a plane. Is it showing any lights? Who was it who's got the How thing? Oh, oh you, you're the one, aren't you, Jason? Yeah. You've got the program <coughs> which you ha that tells you where planes come and go. It's the first nut sound we've heard up where here. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. It's above the clouds, not showing any lights, but there is a, there's a plane just flow over us. <coughs> I know. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> well, I'm honestly, I'm surprised that we're the only ones. I mean, really, if if we we we're, we're the only ones, yeah. it just goes to show that. I mean, but I'm I'm, I'm glad. Dedication. Yeah. Because bit of, bit of Roy Castle. Dedication. 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 Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't get this at the fifty, if, at the forty four fiftieth anniversary of Roswell, but. It's, this is still not as well known, Bedouin yeah, Mountains. For you though, isn't it? Yeah. Mind you, we've done something to change that, I think. To, 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 I think we're going to be known as pioneers <laughs> for this. I keep seeing, thinking I've seen shapes. Where is it? Shadow. Uh, <clears throat> oh, this is, a, this is the flight tracker. Yep, there ice, there's a plane, yes. Let's head into those Wel Welsh pool shoes, we. Yep. There's our plane. That's what we just saw. This is a useful app that. I mean, um I've seen it on the I've seen it on my PC Where are I've used. From? It's at thirty seven thousand feet. Uh, uh, that's pr pretty high. That's even higher than us. <coughs> mm. Yeah, it's um, it's um I used Flight Tracker when a stain went on holiday. You can see those lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there they are. That's the lights down in the valley. I tell you what, in the in the daytime, this is like an alien landscape. It does look alien. It's yeah, like yeah. it's not you, you come. It's like another world up here. You can't see hardly anything of the world outside. It's like being, it's like almost lunar. It's probably better off that there's not been much human um, settlement on, on this, mm. you know, um, interaction. Yeah, and it's probably I mean, some it's, magic still here. That's probably what it is. It is also. It's the fact. It's it's very uh, it's very high up and it's rugged. It's not easy to put to put settlements here. <laughs> Yeah, maybe there's a portal. Well, it could be. I mean, over the, um... well, if we if we go down after we go home after this and lights and traffic lights turn blue, then it means we've moved into a parallel universe, <laughs> and it means our Panama TV viewers, you won't be watching this. <laughs> You'll just be wondering where the hell we all went to. We'll be one more mystery to chalk up on the on the list of the <laughs> Janet and Colin Board will be writing about us in the Fortean Times. Right. <laughs> the missing ufologists. It was a dark. A cold night when the, on the 40th anniversary of the Bedouin Mountains UFO incident, when these three men they give a list of our names and mugshots, climbed up, yeah. decided to go for, to walk up the pass to, to recreate the yeah. atmosphere. Never <laughs> 40 years ago to the. Yeah. Hmm. Oh wow! Imagine seeing that in the sky. Yeah, we hear about that. 
that um, incident in France. Which one? Where that um, couple were, I think it was in the 50s, and they were driving, 50s or 60s, they were driving, and I think they got lost. But it was getting dark, and uh, obviously they wanted somewhere to stay for the night. And they saw this like farmhouse B&B, &B, and they pulled in and asked for the bed for the night. <coughs> anyway, they, they pulled in and they gave them the, the bed and everything. Long story short, they put them up for the night and loved it. Uh, a couple of years later, they're back at home in England, and uh, they said, well, shall we go to that place again that we found in France? I love that one. So they went back and uh, they couldn't find it anywhere <laughs> along the road where they were, where they were. Mm. couldn't find it anywhere anyway they, they stopped off at the nearest town like a portal mm. <laughs> yeah, time, the time slip mm. yeah and they asked um they yeah, asked the people in the uh, the village where this farmhouse was i think the the name the actual name it you know it, it was called something so that that was that was bombed during the war blimey <laughs> That is, but that's one of these yeah, interdimensional yeah. slips or time yeah. slips, isn't it? Yeah. But if it, were they yeah. paying the same prices though? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to. That's uh, this is our sky watch here, and uh, a panel to you viewers. Um, I shall join you for join me for the next part of this film. I'm gonna have to stop filming you because basically my hands are freezing. <laughs> it is Carl. <laughs> Hospital porters, pride and dignity, stop the new world order. That's not very. Okay, we th th thought think we think we saw something. Uh, did you did you yeah, think? Just over here, buddy. Oh, let me just put that one off. Get me, just take my gloves off. Um, what did you see? Uh, just a flash over of light there, over here. Uh, J yeah, Jay's just seen a, a flash of light just over by Munith Munith Bedouin. I listen to this noise. Yeah, look, look, look. Yeah. Seems to do that. There's like something glowing. Yeah, there's something over there. There is something over there. I think that's why he's getting all the attention. Look at that, how it's emanating light. Yeah, look, there's got, we've got something, guys. Have we? Yeah. There's a light glow over there. Straight ahead. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Maybe. What is that? It's just like, it's just a light, but... Yeah. Now, the noise you can hear, Hapan on TV viewers, is a crop circle sound. We have an app on someone's phone. But that light chirping light sound is called... Well. It's a... It's a... Uh, these could be stars through the clouds, but we're not sure. Straight ahead. Yeah. But that is definitely yeah. amazing. Like. These chirping sounds, they are the ch crop circle noise, which people hear, in, these are in crop circle fields. And these clever chaps have a mobile phone app, which reproduces it. Where's it going? Over there? That isn't my yeah. eyes. No. There's something over there. Okay, it's, it's very, very faint, but it's there. On that ridge. Yeah. It's faint, but it's glowing. It is glowing. It's emanating light. Yeah. <coughs> I expect my camera is not picking it up, so a panel TV, you won't be able to see it. I mean, I can hardly see it myself, but there's something emanating light over there. It's not responding to our own light. I saw the light before that laser. Then yeah, I saw mm. the light over there. Then yeah, could be a torch. Could be a, another load of yeah. UFOs yeah. over there. Is there another load of people? <laughs> Maybe it's my job. That they've got to be pretty sturdy to get up onto up onto that <coughs> mountain at night. But you never know. Oh, we have a, like a glowing. There's a car coming. Better get off the road. Yeah. Just finally, there's not. We're not the only people around this time. Oh, <laughs> that's a dick. <laughs> I know that now. It's it's the there's some weird people around. Turn the lights off in case. Or is that yeah. going to freak out the car even more? I don't know. <laughs> there's a, it's the first other vehicle we've seen since we've been here. But there's another car coming. He's probably shit there is, Yeah. Wondering what these weird people are doing up here at night. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously not very fun, knows, doesn't know much about UFO history. Yeah. I can barely see it, but I think there is something, yeah. I did, I did see it, I must admit, I did see that green yeah. thing earlier. I haven't seen it since, but... Is that a free app, that one? No, it's about £5, I think. It's nice. 
That's the sound of crop circles. Yeah. People hear them when they, when they have crop circles, when they see crop circles being done. <sighs> Interesting to see if there's any crop circles how that takes up this year as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna put my gloves on. I'm trying. I can I operate my camera with my gloves on? That's the question. I don't think I can. I need to keep like, one glove off. I suppose my hand's freezing pretty soon, so I can't do this for too long because it's getting cold. Yeah, I'm bloody knackered, you know. I'm gonna need. I think I'm gonna have to get some sleep in the car. I mean, I had this idea that I could do a good old-fashioned portering night shift and wander around, but that was before I hardly slept last night. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna have to sleep in Colin's car, just <laughs> sitting in the seat, which is not a problem. I've slept in worse places. Um, if I snore, Colin can give me a jab in the chops. I hear a noise. Aircraft. OK, we've got a, an aircraft. That wasn't the light we saw. There's an 80% chance. You imagine chance how freaked out a driver if, if you're all dressed up as, like, metallic suits <laughs> and shit like that. He'd actually, you know, he would never talk about it, would you? Yeah. He would just say, I saw something last oh. night. Yeah. Good. yeah. Good. I mean, you can see how it's easy it is to do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> you probably think, oh, weird. Yeah. What about them fucking all dressed up in them scream masks? <laughs> that would really be, that would really be a card, wouldn't it? That is that would be really cruel, wouldn't it? Anonymous, man. You really just yeah. pile through this, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 Skittles, knock them all over. That's what I do. I just think... You're like the zombie apocalypse. Uh, all over there. there. Yeah. The clouds are thicker over there. Well, you the clouds are thicker over there. Well. Yeah. That's gone now. The clouds are thicker. Yeah. Um, organite thingy, you know. Like. I've got some organite in my pocket. She's well, something, because that apparently that's supposed to attract. Look, um, cloud busters attract UFOs, which you're using a cloud buster. Yeah. Um, they attract UFOs, yeah. Are you filming still? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's a... Oh, no, no, don't worry. No, it's all right. Well, it's, it's an adult It's adult viewing. <laughs> I didn't mind. <laughs> no, silent. Yeah. That's what you call a fucking cloud bus. <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> okay, right, well, uh, the light is... That was. It's disappeared now. There's a slight glow, a fuzzy, a fuzzy light over on the wood, on the... On the top of the... On the top of Kadev Bedouin. So... Still the next point of interest. Well, uh, we ended the sky watch about, at about two o'clock in the morning. Um, we saw several things of interest, um, which sort of uh, we, we couldn't positively identify. We don't know what they were. At one point, we saw what looked like a large glowing object behind the hills. It turned out to be the moon, which is just on the horizon. Got to look out for these things. I saw something that looked a bit like it might some a flashing of um, some creature wandering nearby. I think it was probably a deer. I'm not sure. But there were some woods nearby. Maybe the deers live in there. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, but, uh, but maybe Scott Felton can help me out there. Um, do deers live that high up in the mountains, Scott? Um, but um, then we sort of headed back to where we parked. We were actually parked in the little lay-by which Pat Evans used, which is uh, just up by the the county border between Gwynedd and Denbyshire, right? Um, just a few hundred yards up from where we were where we stopped. Uh, someone had brought a, a prepper stove, so we had a cup of tea, and uh, then we went to bed. Well, uh, bed being our cars, um, I was. Um, it turns out we were quite lucky with the weather because, when, as, as you saw, when we started our sky watch, there was not a breath of wind. The sky was fairly clear. The air was pretty clear. The clouds were, were high. And there were some gaps between the clouds so we could see the sky. Um, that situation did not last very long. Well, good morning, Hapano TV viewers. It looks like you've got the best of the weather. I'll tell you, I mean, look at it now. We're, I think we were in the middle of a cloud. Hello. 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 <laughs> <laughs> You're right, mate. Yeah. We're in the middle of a cloud, I think. Not cloud above us. Um, pouring with rain. You can easily see how people die up here. It's freezing cold. Um, we were bloody lucky, weren't we? Oh, 
Yeah, just a bit. How can you imagine? <laughs> and I slept quite well, actually. I slept... Oh, I've got the... I've got this... Let me take that off. Let me take... Do, do you want a drink before you get off? Do you? I don't. I don't. Right. So right. You're all right. Appreciate yeah. the offer, mate. Right, mate. <laughs> Did you sleep all right? Quite a couple of hours, I think. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't sleep for ages. Not exactly no. yeah, the best, was it? But... I couldn't get the alarm. To, did you see my alarm no, going off last year? That was weird. I couldn't work <laughs> out. I had to turn. For some reason, it kept setting the alarm. <sighs> so I had a, quite a good sleep. My feet are like a lump of ice at the moment. I'll be alright when the heating gets on. You know, it'll thaw out. But yeah, so it's a bit cold up here. <coughs> anyway, a panel of cheese for you. Right, we're well, uh, all going off home. Just going to have a quick drink and then. Okay. Uh, I'll see you later. I'll take it easy, mate. It's nice to yeah. nice to see you. Nice, nice to see you. Nice one. Nice one. See you later. Yeah. See you yeah. Take care. Bye bye. See you oh. later. You're right, Connor. How yeah. are you? Yeah, not too bad, considering. Yeah, yeah. Not too bad. Colin is a, a bloody hero for me. It was a bit cold, <laughs> um, feet wise, mm. but it was alright. Yeah, I, my feet was my my feet was the only real cold problem. Because Colin lent lent me half his sli sleeping bag, which comes apart luckily. Uh, otherwise, I'd have been buggered. It was, it was a cold one. Mm, but uh, we'll uh, soon warm up once we get going. And um, well, it's been quite an experience, that's all I can say. <coughs> More later. Well, I'm back. I'm back home. Uh, a bit sleepy. <laughs> I, I got more sleep last night than I expected to, actually. Um, and I, I was quite comfortable um, in Colin's car. Uh, a bit worried, actually. I think I might be losing my hospital porter's ability to avoid drowsiness and to be, stay awake any time of day or night. I mean, I know when I went to Don Phillips' ghost hunt in that pub, um, I uh, sort of like said, it's a good old-fashioned portering night shift. But to be honest, uh, that location was very, very different to the one I was in this time. It was a lot warmer and a lot drier. Um, anyway, um, the uh, the event is o the event is over, but I'm certainly keeping the Bedouin Forty Facebook group open because, as I said, I hope this is the start of a process and not the end. I want uh, this. I'm hoping that this this 40th anniversary and our commemoration of it will trigger a new era of investigation into the Bedouin Mountains UFO incident and try to cover up some of these um, strange enigmas strange uh, mysteries surrounding it which are quite unique to um, this particular subject and um, I should point out right now actually some of you may be new to the UFO subject altogether um, you may have heard about UFOs or the PNH Peth Nidwedi Narbod and Hedvan the Welsh for UFO well it's it's as I said it's a word I made up I don't know if it's proper Welsh or not apologies to anyone who thinks I've, if I've got it wrong um, but there are some, there are some, um, you know, you've got to be careful when you get involved in ufology, because um, there are problems with it. And the Bedouin Mountains incident has been particularly hit hard by this, and that is uh, the fact that information is suppressed and distorted within the ufological world too. That what I mean is that there are people who are in the UFO investigation community who are actively trying to prevent the truth of this getting out. And you've got to be aware of that. Now, the, the biggest enigma, the biggest mystery, whatever, the biggest conundrum, whatever word you choose to use about this UFO or PNH or OVNI. OVNI, OVNI is Spanish. Um, I don't know what it stands for. E-O-V-N-I. Wherever you are in the world, it's something up in the sky that comes down to ground or sometimes it's in the sky and you don't know what it is and it doesn't fit into explanations, but that's a UFO. Anyway, like I said, this the, the enigma or conundrum or mystery of this particular case, the Bedouin Mountains UFO case, um, and I think this makes it almost unique within the world of major UFO events, is that the government knew it was going to happen. And that, I think, is the question, the biggest question hanging over this. And I think that's the question I want to leave you with which I hope will encourage answers to that question more than any other. Because I think when you get answer to that question, you come to the, get to the bottom of this mystery. As I've explained, um, and um, I think this, this came up in Richard D. Hall's film as well, um, there's no way that the government could have reacted as quickly as they did to the event that night 40 years ago unless they already had people 
who knew it was going to happen and were stat waiting nearby the army the uh, military um uh, military presence in the area there was um a lot of army lorries and vehicles around as you've heard and uh, they and pat evans i mean I, I made a few inaccuracies actually when i was reporting back then but um pat evans what she saw she saw people on the mountainside with torchlights um surrounding the object the spherical orange object and as you as i've explained as well you've seen um that area in particular is very very difficult to get to it's very inaccessible it's very hostile it's a very hostile environment which means that there must have been people in the area, even maybe even before the object landed and before the explosion of the earth tremor they may well have actually been people on that mountain camped out waiting maybe soldiers maybe the men in black and other agents i don't know but someone working for the government knew that was going to happen and they were there there's no evidence to say that with Roswell, for example, that the government knew beforehand that that event was going to happen. Same with Rendlesham Forest. They reacted to it happening. They didn't know it was going to happen, so they could essentially be ready to react when it did happen. That's what makes the Bellwood, Bellwood Mountains incident unique, and I think that is what I'm going to be pondering over in the aftermath of this 40th anniversary of the incident and I ask you to ponder it too well I want to thank lots and lots of people I mean Colin Wolford in particular um, for everything he did without him this film wouldn't have been made no doubt about it uh, thanks to of course Jason Neil Jay Mark and um, you know, thanks for being there, those guys on Skywatch with me. Thanks to Rob Treehouse, who turned up earlier on. It's nice to see him again. He's my friends there, who some I've met before, some I haven't. Um, also, I'm sorry to for, to uh, my friends Lisa and Samantha, who are members of the Better in 40 group, who couldn't get there. Um, there was quite a few people confirmed they were going to come and couldn't make it. So, uh, sorry you could, guys couldn't get there. We're, we're sure you can get to future events. Um, and of course, um, as far as the research goes on this, um, there are a number of researchers who have tried to keep the candle of truth burning here, and they've tried to get to the bottom of this, and they haven't been put off by the disinformation. I want to pay particular homage to Scott Felton and to Margaret Fry. Uh, Margaret couldn't be there. She wasn't very well. Margaret, I'm sorry. I hope you get better soon. Um, I have met you once before. It'd be nice to meet you again. And he would. Um, and I want to... Uh, Thank Richard D. Hall as well for supporting this event and um, for uh, coming along and screening his film. I know that I think that encouraged a lot of interest in the event that wouldn't not otherwise be there. And a lot of people, I think, some people did turn up when they might not have done otherwise. So uh, thanks very much, Richard. And, uh, I know a lot of people paid interest in this event when they wouldn't have done otherwise. So, um, and thanks, of course, to you, Hapanmo TV viewers, for watching. And for supporting me over the years, um, this I hope you have enjoyed this Hapanmo TV reportage of the Better in 40 event. There's a lot more to come. I've got a lot more planned. This is certainly not the end. As I said, this is the beginning, I think, of a process. And um, there's a lot more coming. And uh, whatever happens, whatever developments there are in this issue and many others, you can bet Hapanmo TV will be there, exclusive on the scene, to bring it to you. All, all the information that you need and in 10 years time it will be the 50th anniversary of the Bellwood, Mount, Bellwood Mountains UFO incident all I can say is I hope by then we know a hell of a lot more than we do now hospital porters pride and dignity stop the new world order <laughs>